good morning, everybody. What a great time of worship as we celebrate our Waymaker God. Somebody say amen to that. What a great, great time of celebration. If you've got a Bible with you, let me hear your pages turning this morning to the Gospel of Matthew in the 12th chapter. I want to welcome everyone who's joining us today. I want to give a special welcome to anyone who might be a guest with us this morning. I want to give a warm welcome to everyone who's joining us online. This is, as you just heard, week two of a very special message series called Now More Than Ever. And as I mentioned last week, I'll be the first to say that sounds like a really odd title. But as I look around the world today, honestly, I feel this overwhelming sense that people who are followers of Jesus need to live genuine, faith-focused lives now more than ever because with every passing day, our world is becoming more and more broken as it drifts further and further away from God. And you have to have your head buried in the sand to not recognize that reality about life today. And so we began last week with a message called, What Do You See?, And our specific emphasis is when you look at your past, when you look at your future, when you look in the present, what do you see? Uh, We looked at a couple of verses from the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6, verses 22 and 23, where Jesus says, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that Darkness, And we talked about the truth that Jesus speaks those words in the context of the Sermon on the Mount as he's talking about the need to store up treasure in heaven. But like so many other passages in the Bible, there is a spiritual principle or truism in those words that can be drawn out of that context and applied to so many different aspects of life. And here it is in its most simple form. When you can't see clearly, you're in trouble. I mean, that's just a fundamental truth of life. Any, nobody would deny that. When you can't see clearly, you're in trouble. It's true in the literal sense because if you can't see clearly, you're going to struggle just getting from one place to the next. But it's also true in the sense of perception. And that's kind of the way we viewed it last week. If you can't clearly see or perceive God in your life, what God is doing in your life, you're going to have a hard time understanding your life. And that's what we talked about with regard to the past and the future and the present. If you look at the past and all you see is regret and mistake and pain, or if you look in the future and all you see is is fear and uncertainty, and you look at today and all you see is just a list of to-do things that you have to check off in order just to survive and you don't see God's presence in any of those things, then you're missing out. We need to see the past, we need to see the future, we need to see the presence, or present rather, through the eyes of God's love and God's mercy and God's grace. And that's what we really talked about last week. This, winter, this week we're gonna continue uh, by talking about the words we speak. Last week was what we see and this week it's the words we speak. And we're gonna do that because the Bible in so many different places makes it so very clear that our words are powerful. And that brings us to Matthew chapter 6, or 12 rather. So if you've got your Bible open there and you're able, go ahead and stand with me for the reading of the scripture. The very last two verses of the chapter. And just like last week, uh, or not the very last two verses of the chapter, the very last two verses of a section in my Bible where Jesus is called the Lord of the Sabbath. But just like last week, these aren't the verses we're gonna study Uh, from a word-by-word or line-by-line perspective. These are the foundation verses for the other things we're going to talk about. So this is what Jesus says. But I tell you that men will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every careless, everyone say careless, careless word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted and by your words you will be condemned. All right, there it is. You can be seated. We always ask that God would bless the reading and the hearing of his word. Let's just take a brief moment for explanation because we always need to understand the verses that we read in context. Jesus, in this passage of scripture, is rebuking the Pharisees, the religious leaders, for rejecting him and for rejecting his message. And so that's why when you get to the last verse we just read, Matthew chapter 12 and verse 37, he says to the Pharisees, by your words you'll be acquitted and by your words you'll be condemned. Now this all begins in the first of the chapter, first part of the chapter, when the Pharisees accused Jesus' disciples of breaking the Sabbath by gathering some heads of grain, picking some heads of grain to eat as they walked through a grain field. It got 
deeper a little later when they went into the synagogue and Jesus healed a man with a shriveled hand. And this confrontation or conflict with the Pharisees ultimately came to a head when Jesus healed a demon-possessed man. And they, upon hearing people around say positive things about Jesus and what he had done, they accused Jesus of casting out Satan, casting out demons by the power of Satan himself. And so... If you read Matthew chapter 12, those first 37 verses, you'll see that at every point, with every accusation, Jesus countered what the Pharisees, what the religious leaders had to say, but they stood firm in their unbelief and they stood firm in their rejection of him. So in the end, Jesus makes this point. He says that a tree is known for its fruit in that the kind of fruit a tree produces reveals what that tree is really made of. And then he made the point that in the same way, the mouth, because we speak from the heart, the mouth the words we speak reveal what we're really like, what's going on inside of us in the deepest part of who we are, and that's our hearts. And so ultimately, that's why Jesus says we are justified by our words or we are condemned by our words. Now, that is a very quick and brief explanation of the context of the verses we just read. But just like last week, there is a spiritual principle or truism in these words about what Jesus says about the words that we speak. And we can articulate it in a number of different ways, a truism that applies to a lot of different areas of life. We could articulate it in a number of different ways, but I'm gonna try to make it really, really, really simple and just say it like this. The words we speak will always have a positive or a negative impact on our lives. The words we speak, I'm talking about you and me, I'm not talking about somebody else. Every single day of our lives, The words we speak to ourselves, the words we speak to other people, those words are always going to have a positive or a negative impact on our lives. And that's what we're going to talk about in week two of now more than ever, because if we're going to live genuinely faith-focused lives, we need to be mindful of the words that we speak now more than ever. So having said that, I'm going to begin with a crazy story that sounds too far-fetched to be true, and maybe it is. I'm gonna put a name up on the screen. You can read it. Masaru Emoto. He was a Japanese businessman, author, and pseudoscientist who claimed that human consciousness could affect the molecular structure of water. And he talked about that in a 2004 book he wrote called The Hidden Messages in Water. Ultimately, it became a New York Times bestseller. Now, Uh, Emoto's ideas evolved over the years, but the bottom line is this. He believed that water could react to positive thoughts and words to the point that even polluted water could be cleaned through prayer, through words, and through positive visualization. So in the 1990s, Emoto performed some experiments on the effect that water, uh, excuse me, on the effect that words have on frozen water. Now, by the way, the technical term for frozen water is ice. (laughs) I thought that was so silly when I read it that way. Frozen water. When you look at frozen water that is free from all impurities under a microscope, you'll see beautiful ice crystals that look just like snowflakes. That's how perfectly pure water looks when it becomes frozen, when it becomes ice. But when you look at water that's polluted by chemical additives uh, or other things like that, then those snowflake-looking crystals won't appear. And so this was his experiment. He poured pure water into containers, and he labeled them with negative phrases like, I hate you, and fear. After 24 hours, the water was frozen, but not crystallized. You couldn't see the snowflakes in the water, or in the frozen water. In fact, just the opposite happened, and the water became gray and murky and filled with these crazy misshapen lumps as it froze. He then poured pure water into containers labeled with positive phrases like, I love you, and peace. And 24 hours, the frozen water in those containers produced perfectly shaped, sparkling crystals. Now, push the pause button. This sounds really stupid, doesn't it? (laughs) I mean, honestly, let's just be honest. Just say what you're thinking out loud, okay? (laughs) Pastor Chris, I've trusted you for 22 years, but you're, you're teetering on the edge right now with this story. Well, when Emoto's book came out, one of the big criticisms was that there wasn't enough evidence for his hypothesis for what he was saying. And so he performed a similar experiment with white rice. This time he put white rice in containers, filled them with water, 
and instead of labeling the, labeling the containers like he did in the previous experiment, <clears throat> he brought those into a classroom that he was teaching. And he told the students that they were to take the containers, certain containers, and speak positive words to them like, I like you. And then other containers, they were to speak insulting words to like, you're ugly. And after 30 days, according to him, the rice in the jar that was constantly insulted had shriveled into dark gray mushy, yuck, whatever. The rice in the jar that was spoken to in an affirming way was as white and fluffy as the day it was made. I'm telling you, honestly, first response, no way. That's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. And maybe it is, folks, because I didn't do a deep dive of research into this. I did a little bit of research. And to be honest with you, I'd have to say that the research I did was at best inconclusive. But it's kind of an interesting story. And here's why, here's why I tell you that. And... Honestly, I wouldn't have even been tempted in my life to believe that there was any truth to that story except for something that Sandy and I experienced about a month ago when we were at a pastor's conference sponsored by the Solomon Foundation. Now, this particular pastor's conference sponsored by the Solomon Foundation happened on a Caribbean cruise. I know, it is tough being a pastor. (laughs) It has been this sacrificial, meager life for so long. But somebody's got to do it. Somebody's got to serve the Lord with joy, no matter what the circumstances are. So while we were on this pastor's conference, there were about 400 of us there on this Caribbean cruise. uh, We had speakers and we had sessions and lessons and breakouts and all kinds of things related to ministry and life and things like that. And so one of the speakers was a guy named Dr. Alan Zimmerman, which Sandy and I had met before because he's been involved in Solomon Foundation events in the past. And he got up and he was talking about the power of our words. And as a demonstration, he, 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 just, he just picked man up from the front row. Like I said, I, I would say, Ray, come on up here. You don't have to. And, and the guy came up on stage and uh, he said, we're going to do a little experiment. I want you to put your arms out like this. And I want you to hold your arms as stiff and as strong as you possibly can, because I'm going to put my hands on both your arms and I'm going to try to push them down. But you do everything you can to resist. And he said, okay. And so he said, it was time to do it. And he put his arms out and he did. And Dr. Zimmerman put his arms, hands on his arms and he couldn't push them down. He said, now here's what we're going to do. I'm going to send you out of the room. I've got an assistant here who's going to take you out of the room to a place where you can't hear what's going on. But I want, to know, I want you to know before you leave the room that we're going to be talking about you while you're gone. Everybody, all 400 of us, we're going to be talking about you while you're gone. And so they took him out of the room. And when he was secured in a place where he couldn't hear what was going on, then Dr. Zimmerman Zimmerman turned to us and said, I want everyone here to think negative thoughts about that guy, whatever it might look like in your mind. I want you to speak in your mind. You can even do it out loud if you want to. I want you to think and speak negative words about that guy. Whether you know him or you never saw him before, he came up on stage, that's what I want you to do. And so that's what we did for a a little while. In my mind, I'm thinking, what an idiot, what a moron, you know. (laughs) You look like, whatever, I don't know what I was thinking. Then they brought him back in and they put him up on the stage and said, okay, we're going to do the same, we're going to do the same experiment. I want you to put your arms out. I want you to make him as stiff as can because I'm going to try to push your arms down, but you resist. And so they did. And this time he pushed his arms down with ease. Just with ease. Like it was nothing. So to further uh, uh, illustrate the experiment, he let that man sit down. Then he just, he called a woman up, like I called my wife Sandy up here. And she was crying already. She was crying. She felt so bad about the man. And then her anxiety just went to the, to the uh, 10 out of 10. And she was, got up there and she was wiping away the tears. And she, she said, I can't believe what happened to that guy. Anyway, so we're going to do the same thing. I said, I want you to hold your arms out. I want you to resist. He put his hands on. He couldn't push your arms down. And then <clears throat> he said, uh, Uh, I want you to do it again. And this time I'm going to speak to you. And right there in front of everybody, he spoke negative words to her, fearful words to her, anxious words to her. And boom, her arms came down as soon as it happened. And then he said, put your arms up again. And he said, you are chosen by God. You are loved by God. You are kept by God. You you, You are at peace with God and all these things. And this time she was able to resist. It's a true story. True story. And so then he said, do that out in the audience. He said, if, you know, you're couples, do that. Husbands and wives, do that. Well, it was kind of a, this kind of a day at sea. <laughs> so Sandy said, I'm out. <laughs> but there was another pastor sitting next to me whose pastor wife said, I'm out too. So he and I did this together. Same thing. Exact same thing happened. Now, it sounds kind of crazy. And I probably would have been skeptical about a story like that if somebody just told it to me. But I sat there, I sat there and watched it and experienced it with my own eyes and my own physical body. It was amazing. 
there is so much power in the words that we speak. Now, granted, a lot of that has to do with the way those words are received, but there is so much power in the words that we speak that we have got to really be careful and guard ourselves against speaking what Jesus called, if you remember in our text, it's that two-verse text, what Jesus called careless words. And I would venture to guess that all of us here speak hundreds, if not thousands, of careless words either to ourselves or to circumstances or to the people around us every single day. Those, that, that phrase, careless words, in the original language of the New Testament is a Greek phrase, argos rhema, and literally it means unprofitable. And if we're going to live genuinely faith-focused lives in this time in the world where things seem to be unraveling around us, and now more than ever, we got to be really thoughtful about the words that we speak. And so that's what I want to talk to you about for the remaining time that I have. And I, I want to say before we go any further that we have to be careful about this because, you know, there are people who will take some of these truths that we're going to look at in the scriptures and uh, e exaggerate them to the point where they think, where they try to get you to believe that you can literally speak any thing, any circumstance, any reality into being just with your words. And you see that, for example, when you turn on the TV and you see a prosperity gospel preacher that says, you know, you can speak wealth into your life and things like that. And that's an abuse of some of the principles that Jesus teaches us or that uh, God gives us in his word. But we got to remember that just because someone abuses some spiritual truth doesn't mean that it doesn't continue to be true. Somebody say amen to that. People always want to take things to extreme and take them out of context, but that doesn't mean that the fundamental truth that's being communicated isn't still true. And so we just got to remember that, and we got to remember that our words matter. Remember Jesus said, "For your word, by your words you'll be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. And so just like last week when we were talking about what do you see, and I said, really, you, in a sense, you could say what you see is what you get as you go through life based on your perception of God's work in your life, you can literally say the same thing about your words. What you say in some ways is what you're going to get. So we gotta make sure that we avoid those careless words. So let's talk about the power of our words from two perspectives. Here's the first point, if you'd like to take notes, write this down. The words you speak to yourself. We gotta avoid careless, avoid careless words when it comes to the words we speak to ourselves. Some people call this self-talk and it's something that we all do in some way pretty much all day long. And anybody here who just thought, well, that's crazy, Pastor, I don't do that, you just did it. So get over yourself. This is something we all do all day long. And we do it at a much faster pace than we talk to other people. According to one study, we speak to ourselves at a rate of four, note this, 4,000 words per minute. That's 25 times faster than the way I am speaking to you right now, that's how fast we talk to ourselves. And this self-generated barrage of words comes at us nonstop all throughout the day. And these words are either self-empowering or friends, they are self-defeating. And that's what we've got to avoid. So we need to make sure that we talk to ourselves in the right way. Well, let's think of a biblical example of how we do that. Um, the Old Testament King David is going to play a prominent role in our message uh, this weekend in a couple of illustrations. The first one, and interestingly enough, yesterday at our men's breakfast, our high school pastor, Matt Pineda, shared this reference from David's life as a part of his morning devotion. But there was a time in David's life when he was on the run from King Saul. I don't have time to recount the story for you, but you know, David slew Goliath and he was embraced by Saul. He took him into his, into the palace, into the court of his, of his kingdom there and just treated him like a son. But things went south because of Saul's jealousy and, and uh, because of the fact that David ultimately was anointed to be the next king of Israel after Saul. And so there was a time when he was hiding from Saul and on the run. And one time it got so bad, he was actually living in the land of the Philistines, which were the enemy of, enemies of the Israelites. And he was living with a men who followed him, some faithful men who followed him in a place called Ziklag. And he was actually fighting alongside the Philistines. But there was one event when David and his men showed up to fight and the Philistines said, no way, we don't want you. We don't trust you. We don't know you except by reputation. We don't trust you. So just leave and go home. And so they left and they went to their home in Ziklag. And you read what they found in the first six verses of 1 Samuel chapter 30. Let me just read those verses to you real quick. You don't have to turn there. Just listen as I read. David and his men reached Ziklag on the third day. Now the Amalekites had raided the Negev and Ziklag. They had attacked Ziklag and burned it and had taken captive the women and all who were in it, both young and old. They killed none of them, but carried them off as they went on their way. When David and his men came to Ziklag, they found it destroyed by fire and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. 
captive. So David and his men wept aloud until they had no strength left to weep. Can you imagine that level of grief? I hope you've never experienced that. David's two wives have been captured, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. David was greatly distressed because the men were talking of stoning him. Each one was bitter in spirit because of his sons and daughters. So that was the circumstance. They came home and their home had been burned to the ground. Their families had been taken off. The entire city had been plundered. They were heartbroken. And when they got past their weeping and their grieving, the men turned bitter towards David and wanted to harm him. Now, what I didn't read is the very last phrase of verse 6. Because this is how David responded to all of that in the end. It, said, but da- it says, but David found strength in the Lord his God. But David found strength in the Lord his God. That's the way it reads in my NIV Bible. Let me read it to you. Let me show it to you on the screen from the King James Version Bible because I like this. It says, but David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. How do you think he did that? How do you think David encouraged himself with all that had just happened and the threat that was hanging over his head in the moment. How do you think David encouraged himself in the Lord his God? Well, I'll tell you what I think, and I believe this without hesitation. I think he did that through the words he spoke to himself. And if you want to know how David spoke to himself, all you have to do is read the Psalms that David wrote. I've got one Psalm that I'm going to use as an example. It's a pretty well-known psalm. It's Psalm 103, where David writes these words. Praise the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost being. Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul. And then David writes, and forget not his benefits. Forget not his benefits. And then David began to list the benefits of God. He wrote this. Who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. And he just goes on and he goes on and he goes on. Those are the words that David wrote. Now look up here, everybody. How many of you know, we all do, that when you sit down to write something, before those words make their way to the paper, they first start in your what? In your mind. As you speak them in your mind to yourself, and then write them down on the page in front of you. And so that's what David did. When everything was so bad in the moment, and when his men were about to turn on him, he encouraged himself in the Lord by speaking to himself about all of the good things of God that he had experienced over and over again in his life. And if he'd experienced those things in the past, then he knew that he was going to be able to experience them in the present and in the future. And if you read the rest of the story, it has a happy ending for the most part. And so we need to speak those kinds of words to ourselves. That means instead of speaking words of discouragement and instead of speaking words of defeat, we need to speak words of uh, blessing and affirmation and goodness We've got enough anxiety, we've got enough fear, we've got enough criticism and enough condemnation all the time. You know, there are going to be times in your life and my life, if you live any length of time, there are going to be times in all of our lives when no one around us is speaking words of encouragement to us. In those moments, we need to speak those words to ourselves. Studies have shown that people who speak to themselves using self-affirming, uplifting words perform more effectively. And this isn't some kind of a positive attitude, self-help sermon. This is the Bible. I don't want you to mistake that. One study I saw this last week published in Procedia, which is a social and behavioral science journal, showed that basketball players, for example, who coach themselves with encouragement actually perform better. Simply saying to themselves, you can do this or you've got this made a difference in how well they played. And if, you know, somebody like an athlete can do that with those kinds of words, how much more can we do that with the very word of God? There was a great event that happened back in 2019 on one of the practice rounds for the Phoenix Waste Management Open um, on the 16th hole, which is a par three, which is the famous par three where everybody gets so rowdy that's kind of gotten out of control in recent years. When Gary Woodland and his playing partner for the practice round, Matt Kuchar, invited a young girl named Amy Bockersteady to play the hole with them, a young girl who was playing college golf at a local junior college who has Down syndrome, I want to show you what happened. Maybe you've seen the clip before. If you've never seen it, 
You're not ever going to forget it. Let's watch it together real quickly. That's him. That's him. Yeah. <laughs> What's he doing? How are you? Are you Amy? Yes. Give me a hug. I'm Gary. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. I hear you're a good golfer. Yes. You are? You want to yeah. come with a hole with us? Yes. Come on. Let's go. Hi, I'm Matt. What's Amy. your name? Amy. Amy. This is John. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I heard you're yeah. a heck of a player. Yes. Awesome. <laughs> you want to hit a shot? Yes. You do? Yes. All right. Let's do it. Oh! <laughs> yeah! <laughs> You want your golf shoes? Oh, we got your clubs right here. Big focus, all right? They love me. I know about that. Here you go. Uh, Ball? Yeah. Nice to meet you. Ready? Let's do it. Yeah. You need a tee? All right. All right. See the flag right in the middle? Yes. You got this, kiddo. Yeah, I got this. Nice. Give me a five. Ah. <laughs> so cool. They love me. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> awesome. You like all these people? Yeah. <laughs> you want to hit it out? Yeah. You do? Yes, I do. Let's, Let's do it. I got Come this. On. I love it. You can do this. You can do this. Nice. Let's go. Let's go putt. We're going to okay. make this. Yeah. <laughs> that is so good. That was awesome. Thank you. <laughs> that was fantastic. Thank you. That was amazing. What do you think? Going a little left? Yeah. Why don't you go ahead and make that? Okay. I got this. You got it? Yeah. Let's do it. so good. Thank you. Amy, it was awesome to meet you. That's You're an inspiration to us, all right? Okay. You're our hero. <laughs> oh, you are amazing. Thank you. I'm so proud of you. You happy? Yes. Yeah. Wow. I got this, right? I got this. They love me. How powerful was that? If that principle can work in the life of someone like Amy Bockersteady, then how much more so can it work in your life and mine with the words of God? And so we, we need to make sure that we have the word of God in our hearts and our lives so we can speak it to ourselves. We don't want to waste time with careless words. We want to speak the word of God. By the way, that, that, uh, that whole uh, event produced a foundation that Amy Bockersteady and Gary Woodland are involved in called the I Got This Foundation that's making a difference in people's lives even still today. So let me put some words up on the screen. These would be some great verses to memorize that we would consciously choose to speak to ourselves. I want you to read them with me, each one. Here we go. Start right here. Philippians 4.13. Let me hear your voices. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Romans 8.37. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. 2 Timothy 1.7. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. And that timidity could easily be replaced by the word fear, and you would still have the accurate translation. These are the words that we speak to ourselves. Our words are powerful, and so when we speak the word of God to ourselves, then it makes a huge difference. Here's the second thing real quickly. There's not just the words that we speak to ourselves, but the words we speak to our circumstances. Write down the words you speak to your circumstances. There's a great story, and I'm sure I've probably told this in the past about Sir Edmund Hillary, who was the first man to reach the summit of Mount Everest. The first time he tried, his effort ended in failure, but he didn't give up, and he tried again by joining another expedition that was trying to get to the top, but it failed this time tragically as a member of the expedition died as a part of the trip, but Hillary wasn't finished, and later that same year, the same year that the second 
expedition failed, he was speaking to an audience about the experience. And behind him on the platform he was speaking was a huge picture or photograph of Mount Everest. And at one point during Hillary's presentation, he literally stopped and he turned around and he faced the photograph and he said these words, Mount Everest, you have defeated us, but I will return and I will defeat you. He said, you cannot get any bigger, but I can. And he spoke to that circumstance. Reminds me of a Bible verse. If you grew up in Sunday school like I did, it might remind you of a Bible verse as well. It's Mark 11, 23. I'm going to read it from the King James Version Bible. I'll put it on the screen from the King James Version Bible. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Those words come from Jesus. Now, I don't believe those words Jesus gave to us for the context of literally moving a physical mountain, but they are words that he gave to us for the challenges in our lives. The mountains of unbelief, the mountains of fear, the mountains of doubt, and on and on and on. And Jesus is telling us to not be afraid or hesitant to speak. Everyone say speak. Speak to the circumstances of our lives. We remember that ultimately God knows best when it comes to the outcomes of our lives, but we can't be afraid to speak God's word to the circumstances of our lives, especially when those circumstances involve anxiety or fear or despair or some other kind of debilitating emotion. I said David was gonna be a prominent character in our message today. One of the greatest stories of the Bible, and I'm sure you would agree, is the story of David and Goliath. When David went to the valley of Allah where his brothers were serving in the army of Israel to take them supplies. He got there in time for the giant Philistine Goliath to come down into the valley and issue a challenge. Don't, let's not have our armies fight, just you, me against your best warrior and whoever wins, wins the whole thing. And David looked around and saw the soldiers in the army of Israel, including his brothers, paralyzed in fear. And so after he asked what would happen for the man who fought and defeated Goliath, he ultimately said in 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse 32, he said, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine, your servant will go and fight him. And then when David went down into the valley, just armed with his slingshot and five smooth stones, and he stood face to face or maybe face to knee with Goliath, this is what he said. This is 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 45 and 46. This is the words he spoke to that giant circumstance in front of him. You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day, the Lord will hand you over to me and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. Today, I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth, and the whole world will know that there is a mighty warrior in Israel. No that there is a God in Israel. And you know what David does in that section of 1 Samuel 17? He shows you how to speak to a giant. Now, what's the giant in your life? Right now, as you're listening to my words, What's the giant in your marriage? What's the giant in your family? What's the giant in your finances? What's the giant in your emotional life? What's the giant when you look in the future? or when you can't get past the past. David shows us how to speak to a giant. Our words are so powerful, especially when they are the word of God because they have the power to ignite our faith. There's a great verse in Romans chapter 10 and verse 17. Paul writes and says, consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard, note this, through the word, everyone say word, word of Christ, or through the word of God. Now, in simplest terms, Paul is telling us that the process by which faith is produced in our hearts and produced in our lives is by hearing the word of God. And while the primary application to that, for the most part, is salvation, that doesn't mean it can't apply to other areas of our lives and moments in our lives when we need to find the faith necessary to go on. The, there are multiple words in the Greek language that are translated word. And so when you read that word, word, in the New Testament, it's good to find out which word is used. In this case, it's a Greek word, rhema, R-H-E-M-A. If you look it up in a Greek lexicon, the literal translation or meaning is utterance, but it's so much more than that. It's the utterance, note this, 
It's the utterance of a specific verse or of a specific portion of scripture that the Holy Spirit uses in the moment, bringing it to your mind to meet whatever your current circumstance or need. And while the greatest need of every life is salvation, that's for sure, we have other spiritual needs that come up in our lives day after day after day. And so that's why we need to know the word of God. We need to know the rhema of God. We don't, I mean, we didn't need to know the general truth of the Bible, but we need to know the rhema, specific truths of the Bible so that we can speak those words into our lives in time of need. If you go to Ephesians chapter six, where Paul starts to write about putting on the full armor of God and you work your way through the different pieces of armor, you'll see that all of the pieces of armor are defensive except for one. There's only one offensive piece of the armor and that's the sword of the spirit, which Paul says is the word of God. You can read that in Ephesians chapter six and verse 17. Take up the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God of God. You know what word he uses for word there? It's the Greek word rhema. And so when some circumstance, even a giant circumstance comes into your life, you need to be so familiar with the truth of God's word that you can speak it to that circumstance just like David spoke those words to Goliath in 1 Samuel chapter 17 verses 45 and 46. Here's the bottom line. The words we speak are powerful. And because of that, we need to speak God's word every time we get an opportunity. I'm out of time, so I need to close. I'm going to put up a single verse of scripture on the screen. I want everyone to read it with me. It's Proverbs 18, verse 21. It's such a beautiful verse. Let me hear your voices loud and strong. Here we go. The tongue has the power of life and death. Those who love it will eat its fruit. We need the fruit of God's word. We need the fruit of positive, the positive word of God, the positive utterances, the positive rhema of God in our lives, if we're going to live lives that are genuinely focused on living out our faith and standing strong no matter what happens, and that's something that needs to happen in our lives now more than ever. So take those words to heart and be mindful of the words you speak, whether they're words you speak to yourself or whether they're words you speak to others or the circumstances around you. Father in heaven, we love you so much and we're so grateful for the truth of your word. And we pray, Father, that you would really impress all of this on our hearts today in a lasting way, in a way that makes a difference. It is so easy, I know this to be true, it is so easy to become a Christian, to come to church even and be faithful, but to really ignore the need, the necessity of learning your word in a way that it gets inside of us and we have those rhema utterances that we rely on as we go through life. It does appear with every passing day that the world around us is unraveling and we shake our heads in anxiety and in fear and in distrust at so many circumstances. And it's easy for so many careless, unprofitable words to come into our minds and to come out of our mouths. But help us to draw a line in the sand today and say no more, no more. I'm going to believe in and practice the power of God's word in a way that makes a difference, not just in my life but in my family, with my friends, and the influence I have in this world. We love you, we pray all that in Jesus' name. And everyone agreed and said?